Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the 5710 podcast. This week's guest is James Whitaker of Whitaker Studio, a small practice based in London but with projects ongoing throughout the globe. The practice gained attention for the Joshua Tree Residence, which was the most popular project on the zine in 2017. So the first place I want to start with, um, you graduated with first class from Edinburgh and you were nominated for the bronze medal. Any advice for students during the university time to sort of achieve success? I know a lot of students, they struggle and it takes them years and years to kind of get into a rhythm and what, what do you think your secret was to success in university time? Maybe it's not secret, oh, but geez, method, yeah, That's a good question. I don't, I don't know if I really ever felt like I had uh, much success at university. Did you not? Yeah, well, I don't know, but I, I definitely think now kind of having worked in a variety of places afterwards I think might like but then you probably already know yourself like for me the biggest inhibitor when I was at university was the fear of making mistakes Mm -hmm. like to the point that I would sometimes like remember I I did far fewer sketches in my sketchbook because what happens if I do a bad sketch like everything (laughs) needed to be good and then you kind of go out and work in the real world in well, work for in some of the offices that I've worked in, and our production of of ideas in a single day would like fill a wall the size of I don't know, the, like the wall in the room that we sat in. And you'd just produce stuff and wouldn't worry about is it is this going to be right or wrong. You is kind it of good or bad? It's just, yeah, you're yeah, kind of it. putting out your ideas, and then once they're down on paper, you can stand back and go, okay, well that's which one has got the most promise, and then take it from there. It's about the multiple iterations of things. It's, yeah. It's what I'm trying to encourage us in the later years, is to you know, just chuck everything out, empty the, empty the sink. And yeah, 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 exactly. And I, I desperately wish now that I'd embrace that mentality when I was at university, because rather than trudging out slowly to get to one idea after two weeks, I think, you reach the end of one day and you've got 20 ideas, mm-hmm. sort of, Jot it down on paper. So yeah, I, that that was probably. I'm sure I could have done more at university had I just embraced that more. It's certainly a hard thing, certainly amongst first years, they're always trying to find the right ideas. You know, it's maybe yeah. It's, certainly, in the later years were encouraged to find not the right idea, but just explore and explore freely and yeah. see what happens at the end of it. And if yeah, it's the wrong yeah. Idea, it's, well, then you know it's the wrong idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, Another question about university time is what kind of architects inspired you? You know, we're always looking for good precedents. And oh, was yeah. there anyone that you? It doesn't need to be an architect. It could be an artist or a designer or we had musicians. Played recently mentioned before. Just kind of. Good question. Good question. I mean, I remember when I was at uni. I like every once in a while I'd treat myself to an El Croquet, um, and say so the ones that I've got of those from from uni. I said like Rem Coolhouse. Uh, Herzog and de Muon. Um, it was I think it was like those guys that I used to like be a big fan of. Still, I'm a big fan of them. I kind of I adore some of their stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like a little bit of everything. I wouldn't say that I've ever been wildly attached to anyone in particular. I'm kind did, of, did you find yourself progressing as you for the years? You know, you start off with the old the old masters of Meeson. Frank Lloyd Wright, and then your next, by the end of it, you're kind of maybe a bit more up to date in your later years, maybe. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm, I'm ever up to date, really. I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, I, yeah, like I, I, I sort of, I, if anything, as time goes by, I find myself devouring more and more and more. I'm probably a better student now than I was <laughs> like 20 years ago when I was at uni. I, I devour so, so many like books now, monographs. Um, do you take in a lot from the internet and social media or do you still try to focus on books depends like it, the internet's really like, it's your gateway drug isn't it mm-hmm. it's your it's your way in most of the time um, and you'll you kind of discover it, an interesting project or a curious project but then to kind of really discover it properly and understand it, the yeah. ideas behind it and the work that preceded it that kind of gave flight to it and the projects that then came after it that were further development of that idea, you kind of, yeah, you have to start diving into the I library. I suppose that's the disadvantage of a website or, or whatever, it's it's all there in front of you. You know, you, you go on an architect's website and it's all their relevant projects, so they're, their best ones, it's not in an order or a progression. Very often. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't tell the whole story. That kind of leads on to, um, you kind of came to uh, notoriety through design and art daily and these websites. 
do you find that they're maybe going to replace architecture magazines or do you think there's a place for both or what's your kind of thoughts on the whole thing? I don't know. I mean, it, in some ways it kind of feels like they're, they've already replaced them, but it, I don't know about the, I don't know the exact figures. But he, I don't think that's unique to architecture even really. Is no, it like the, the printed not. press is massively in decline as everyone's consuming that stuff via the internet. Um, but then, but there's there's counters to that in that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, so I read the Guardian. The readership of or distribution of the, the printed copies is massively down, but now the readership on the internet is phenomenally high because the, the internet allows them to access an international market and get their the articles seen by a much bigger. Uh, collection of people so it, it, and I think that's the same with, with the likes of Dazeen and um, there are plenty of uh, I think people kind of um, can often talk about the foibles or the various intricacies about these websites and kind of some people would like to see more editorial type stuff on them and there's definitely uh, sort of capacity for that out there in the world um, and sort of critical pieces a bit more which have maybe been the mainstay of magazines that we are a bit harder to root out on the internet um, but maybe that's just a natural evolution that mm -hmm. we've kind of come over time um, It certainly has you know, opened the audience to projects and for example last year we had Brian McCallion from Canada in and yeah, it's not so, if you just read Architects Journal, you wouldn't know who he was, but yeah, because exactly. we've seen him in Arc Daily and such things that you know, we got an architect on our side of the world, and yeah, so it's definitely it's the world wide working working in that sense, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, for yeah, like for me, I don't have a single UK based project. Maybe I'm in discussions about one, but but nothing actually on the books at the moment, and that's because I have sort of Whitaker Studio has such good reach across the globe so I've got projects in practically I don't know in like four different continents or something but nothing actually in the, in the same country that I live in and what's that just saying lifestyle like I imagine there'll be a lot of flights or it's a lot of Skype or is it is it a little bit of both like uh, invariably so some of my projects are, are houses where you kind of have to be mindful that of the cost of flying uh, even just a single person all the way over and back Charging yeah, yeah. That, that, like that ends up just the cost of the plane ticket on its own yeah, that that ends up representing quite a big percentage of the fee that you're trying to charge mm -hmm. them so you, you kind of I, I'm always keen to figure out uh, a kind of an appropriate level of how to work with them where we do lots through Skype I mean that's the other great thing about live being doing the work that I do in this day and age is now I can talk to people anywhere in the world using mm -hmm. FaceTime audio or WhatsApp audio or something like you don't have to be running up giant big phone bills I can talk to my client in the Caribbean one minute and then talk to a client in Iceland or Spain or wherever the next minute and it's and is there a struggle with from building regulations, different types of contractors, or do you find there is commonality amongst, you know, very few architects get to work on, as you say, projects around the world at the same time, often it's a big project here, yeah, or different yeah. offices perhaps, you're yeah. one man spread across the globe. Yeah, 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 but it, in some ways, with it, almost every project, I, I think every project so far, I'm always kind of quite keen to for the client to appoint a local architect, mm -hmm. particularly as we get into technical design, someone who, like you say, like who's who can review the design based on local building regs and stuff, because there's just yeah, there's, there's this whole world out there that we know what the rising and going of a stir needs to be in the UK, but to then become some sort of uh, knowledge of it, some sort of uh, workable level of knowledge on it in all these different uh, 
different areas and jurisdictions around the world is just it's not worth it also partnering up with a local architect they have a good knowledge when it comes to tendering they kind of know which builders we should be approaching that sort of thing it's also like i'm saying about the cost of flights it's far more practical for a client or on small like on domestic projects it's far more appropriate for them to be employing a local architect who can deal with a lot of the day-to-day stuff on site. Project management on the thing, yeah. Yeah, well, in a lot of the going to site and then they can get me to fly over if there's a real emergency or something that urgent needs looking at, but they're not paying for a flight for me every week sort of thing. Um, yeah. And I, uh, one thing I would say, I certainly feel for your projects, specifically the Joshua Tree one, is that sort of inspiration from the, the scientific, the sci-fi world of the, you know, it seems quite futuristic. It could be yeah. something out of Blade Runner, it could be something out of um, the fifth element. And I thought that was funny when I read about the Joshua Tree that it was built for a film producer. Is that something you take on? You've also got an interest in CGI's. Are you interested in films? And um, yeah, well, yeah. No, or, or do you I'm separate not... the whole thing? Do you see architecture and CGI as visuals as one thing? And yeah, but it's sort of like same. So like the, well, I, I can tell you all tonight about the origins of Joshua Tree. And essentially, it, it, that, that all got started from looking at um, crystal growth in a laboratory. Oh, okay. like the, the, so it's an interest in science rather than science fiction. Yeah, well, for, sort of, for, for that one, there was a, a sort of an analogy that could be made that kind of sparked an idea. Um, other times... It's something like and then the anywhere house. I guess that was kind of born out of, in a way. That's a bit of a hybrid between a little project that I did, in like maybe my first year of university that was based on a piece of climbing equipment. Mm-hmm. That was an irregular shape, and that combined with then years of working on hotel projects, suddenly kind of gave me this idea of oh okay well if we kind of pair these two things together we could kind of get to this particular end result that I was looking for. Um, but, so yeah, so I'm, like, I'm, I'm a massive film fan and I've, I've been a massive fan of all sorts, really. I kind <laughs> of, I, I'm, I'm very easy to get excited about pretty much anything in life. I, um, and, and I guess really it's that kind of embracing uh, diversity, embracing anything and everything that comes at me that then sends me sends my head off whirring into what would be the right design for this or for that I'm, I'm kind of just constantly like a magpie, kind of constantly looking for different stuff um, I mean, the, yeah the film producer for a client in California is just a, is just a kind of fun a, a fun anecdote really it's kind of like a fun little rock and roll story um, but I guess in reality it had little little effect on the design mm-hmm. other than they, are, they have an appetite for the more artistic end of the spectrum but also the great thing about having a film producer as a client is like their, their whole uh, job their whole being is about somehow turning a creative idea into an end product. Like that, that's what yeah, producers do, sort of happen. thing. The producer, I suppose, has a vision. You know, he has yeah, a... he kind of he'll he'll take the script from one person and pairs it up with the director and, and puts everything in place to help this creative project mm-hmm. happen. And, and and so that's why having. Having those guys as a client is just this wonderful did blessing. Did you watch his films before you went and met him? Did you watch American Psycho and Spring Breakers? And stuff Spring like Breakers, yeah. And, um, so I'd already seen American Psycho and then I've been kind of working my way back through some of his <laughs> uh, back catalogue every once in a while. Um, yeah, so I've seen, I've seen like some of them. I haven't yet to see, see them all. Um, the next question I wanted to ask you was uh, you worked for Heatherworks Studio for a period between 2006 and 2009. Yeah. What's the culture like in that studio? You know, he's a, ma- a man in the press all the time, Thomas Heatherwick. Is yeah. the is working the day to day a bit more 
mundane or as, as exciting as it, as it may seem? Oh, no, yeah, probably more exciting, I reckon. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, it's wonderful. It's really there that I was thinking of when I said earlier about the how we just produce tons of mm-hmm. ideas. Um, I mean, Thomas has, has terrific ideas of his own back, but he's also, he's by far and away the, the, the best boss that I've ever worked for, who is particularly talented at curating other people's ideas and so will surround himself with brilliantly talented people and then will do that sort of iterative process. We'll, we'll fill a, a wall of, I don't know, like five metres by two metres, like a 10 square metres covered in A4 sheets of sketches and computer renderings and photographs of models, whatever. fill it out over a couple of days and then we'll... T- would talk our way through all these ideas and Thomas would be able to identify which ones had the had the most potential. Say, so, okay, right, what if we take a bit of this and marry it with a little bit of this one over here and, mm. and get going? What happens if these two people who've just produced th- this giant wall of material take these two ideas and do the same process again? And through that, it achieves some, some just amazing like end results. It kind of produce and curates and thinks about and um, generates some some cracking stuff. I wonder where he gets that skill, you know, it's not something you can develop for university of, you know, com- um, combining other people's ideas, it may, maybe it is a yeah, I don't know. Very interesting skill to, yeah. to ask him where it came from. Wonder. Yeah, I mean it was also, it was a, a wonderfully enjoyable work environment because you'd find yourselves, there were quite a lot of architects there when I was there um, but we'd also have we'd have like boat builder or boat designers um, theatre designers product designers industrial designers uh, you know, 3D designers I don't know a- anything that you can mm. tag designer <laughs> on the end of they seemed to be there and and that was just that was amazing because because everyone would come to it with come to a problem or come to a design with different uh, backgrounds, different experience, different drivers, motivators, and so everyone would be washing around these completely different ideas. You'd say to a an interior designer maybe, or a I don't know. You say to the boat designer about a reference to Cabuzio thing and he just look at you blankly like <laughs> what, what's the good in there like and uh and in some ways that was quite a good litmus test as well because as an architect we might get very excited about an idea because we're like oh well, this has got great historic precedent but then to the layman to the person out there on the street who's ultimately going to judge the work does it mean anything or, or, or are we like uh okay, can I call yeah yeah, yeah exactly exactly uh so again, I think that that was one of the, the the big strengths of Heatherwick's was that the diversity of voices pouring themselves out. Even the like all the admin team, if anyone was walking past a review and they could articulate their thoughts about what was being shown, their voice was quite ready to be heard. So if a secretary was walking past and was like, "Oh, I don't like that," if they could say why they didn't like it, then the whole lot would get torn down and would, would have to start again start, sort of yeah, thing yeah. but it was that was that was a, a good very kind of very that. incredibly rich environment um yeah really good i would say um from your instagram page you have quite talent for the cgis and the visuals of the world is that uh, something you've developed as just a hobby and something you're interested in and any sort of advice for students that are interested in that kind of field of you know rendering studio max and probably yeah i probably don't have much in the way of advice for it just I, practice 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 yeah like like because i so i used to teach animation and kind of computer type stuff when i was at uni like when i was an undergraduate doing my first degree i was teaching on the msc Good. <laughs> just because it'd be like something that i had a particular penchant for a particular enthusiasm and got kind of quite good at c- certain niches of it and then as i went out into the big wide world and started working for people I would often find myself doing that sort of stuff and it was really I had a I've got a giant 
passion for photography. Mm -hmm. And so the CGI stuff kind of slowly grew out of that. And in a way, yeah, it's been a, I guess, at least in part, that has all been uh, developed kind of as a tactical decision by myself. Partly because I, I, I just, I enjoy doing it a lot. It kind of, I've, I've done some very fun little projects with it. Um, but also, I kind of thought, to be able to to allow myself to, or get gain myself the opportunities to do the work that I really want to be doing, there has, I have to be able to show people what it is that's going on inside mm -hmm. my head. And these futuristic ideas perhaps work best and yeah, well, it, well, sort of. It's just a bit like a saying with. Um, about being the layperson in the street who ultimately judges the work, there's a little bit of that. Like um, a lovely architect's drawing can be lovely and wonderfully appreciated by other architects, but sometimes doesn't have great penetration mm -hmm. into a larger audience. And so I've always been conscious that if I'm wanting to do something that's a little bit more. Uh, a little, little bit different. My best chance of getting to do that stuff is if I can show it, sell it, like make people oh, as enthusiastic yeah. about it as I am. And and CGI is this kind of wonderful uh, and wonderful tool for doing that. Um, and I and in the variety of places that I've worked, worked on all manner of crazy and wonderful projects and it, the, the, the um, percentage of them that fall by the wayside is always been quite high for one reason or another whatever clients or financial recessions or changes of mind or th there's a whole bunch of different things that can kind of come into play and so yeah if there's anything that I can do or learn to increase the chances of being able to share these designs with people, which then helps me find another client mm -hmm. who has a similar enthusiasm for I suppose my that's niche. A, bit, a bit more translatable if you just show architecture drawings. Quite often, they're site specific and kind of stuck yeah. in their own cells. Where an image can be translated into another image, into another image. Yeah, exactly. That's a very interesting way of thinking. About it. Strategic. Well, the last question was one we ask all our guests: is recommendations for a grand tour. Uh, a lot of architecture students like to spend their summers travelling or when they finish university to yeah, yeah, yeah. go someplace whether in Europe or the Americas or anywhere you suggest perhaps somewhere off the beaten track God it's a good question good question and I was thinking about this yesterday it doesn't mean to be a place for architecture it could just be a, a great place to visit yeah okay because one of my uh, one of my friends always wanted to do a grand tour sort of walking by foot from London down to Florence. I always thought that would be a nice journey to oh. do. Like take months, but but to sort of see slowly the changes across the landscape. Um, like a few years ago, I I tried to run coast to coast across the UK. Oh, okay, well, where from? The, like the, there's a Wainwright route between um, St. Bees in Cumbria mm -hmm. across to Robin Hood's Bay in Yorkshire. You kind of go across all the national parks. And that was kind of like a wonderful, a wonderful little journey. I, I kind of compressed it down into quite a short period of time, but it's, that was kind of a pretty grand tour because you get this wonderful moment where you one day you like, one morning you're up on the top of a mountain looking back, and all of a sudden like you you realise you're in the middle of the country and you can no longer see the coast in either <laughs> direction, and all the land that you've covered to that point has been under your own steam. Um, it's maybe not very realistic grand tour option. <laughs> um, I, yeah, walking down to, to Florence would be good. I, I still, I, I'm desperate to do a road trip coast to coast across the US and see like... Because where where it, would you go for it? Just everywhere you possibly could? Or would you go down south or nothing? Yeah, I don't know. Because I'm, I'm, I'd really love to see all the all the little middly bits. Like not, not so much kind of trying to so drive to could, Chicago yeah. and then down to New Orleans or something. More kind of driving across the country and seeing the the little bits of how the the land changes the differences i like 
that sort of stuff fascinates me. Like, I, I really enjoy, um, you know, yeah, like I, I do. I get, I, get a, I get a thrill from going and visiting a site in, I don't know, like in the desert or something, and you go wandering around there, and everything's got a very certain feel and acoustic and things to it. And then you go and visit, I don't know, another site in Spain or something, and the giant vultures on it, doesn't it? <laughs> the, 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 this kind of, these changes that have nothing to do with the, the buildings, but more the land that they sit in. Like, that's the sort of thing that I quite enjoy. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank Correct. you for answering our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, James, for joining us this week. Our next guest will be Victor Enrique, so make sure you tune in for that. Thank you.